Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the internet personality, the best hair. And welcome back to Dino Whenever. This time we'll be taking a look at Rise of the Dinosaurs, a dinosaur-themed horror movie made on a minuscule budget, released straight to video in 2013. You know, I think I just figured out why I keep having nightmares about reviewing the same movie twice. Well, once you get down to the meat of this, it's obviously not anything like the last one at all. A group of soldiers on a secret mission so secret it almost seems completely unimportant wind up in an uncharted jungle where dinosaurs have somehow survived all along. Also, they somehow consist of quite a lot of velociraptors and T-Rexes, which is far more marketable than a jungle full of Yoti Tyrannus. But hey, I'd pay to see such a fluffy horror monstrosity. Anyway, let's take a look at Rise of the Dinosaurs. A.K.A. Jurassic Attack, because every fucking dinosaur movie out there has to have Jurassic in the name, despite focusing on creatures from the Cretaceous era. Our story begins on one of those oh-so-safe rainforest flights for science. The scientist being Professor Roxton, played by Michael Wirth, and his pilot is Bob Driscoll, who is not fucking listed in the credits. Right. Well, that might have to do with exactly what he brings to the table in terms of piloting skills. A thermal bump later, and the airplane mysteriously loses control. This never does get an overt explanation, so we can assume that they simply weren't flying around with the most impressive machine out there. Much like whatever computer was used to come up with this shit we're about to see. Hey, you remember how Raptor Ranch was complete ass, but the effects were pretty okay? Well, this one has a slightly different problem right off the bat. And the movie could be alright, but holy fuck are those dinosaur effects complete ass. Now that the movie has established very quickly that there are dinosaurs in it, and they don't look all that great, we suddenly teleport over to Panama, where a group of soldiers are taking off for a very important mission, as explained by Colonel Carter, played by Corin Nemec. Satellite imaging has located the rebel base, and the rebels are being controlled by none other than Gustavo Marquez. Played by Israel Says Di Miguel. I mean, sure, he's doing all kinds of inhumane things to the people of this area, but at the very least he's not giving a mission brief in like a Sega CD game. Also, they just so happen to not have permission from the local government to intervene, but fuck it, they've got someone very important to rescue. Primary objective is Dr. Angelus Banes, biochemist. She was abducted several months ago from an international conference on bioweapons. That she just so happened to be participating in... from her bedroom in her underwear. I guess this is what happens when TED Talks decide to start attracting viewers like Twitch streamers. Either way, she's played by Natasha Berg, and kinda sorta might have been forced to make a chemical biological weapon thing that can be loaded on missiles for Marquez. Thus, they have to go in, save her, and prevent the rebels from getting such terrifying weapons. And if you fail, I have orders to level the entire area. I'm talking bombing that place completely out of existence. Okay, dude, calm down. I understood it. Level the entire area. You don't gotta go all fire and brimstone on me here. We need to introduce complications before they even get to the drop point, though. As such, Chief Sarah Hadelman, played by Alicia Ziegler, points out that Captain John Stakely, played by Gary Stretch, just so happens to have a personal vendetta against Marquez. So let's ignore that and get right to the drop. Not knocking your style here, but... Now, I'm pretty sure if Solid Snake had been sneaking into that Alaskan base in a synchronized swimming team blaring heavy metal music, the game would have been a lot shorter. Fortunately, Marquez doesn't notice the USO show going on right above him, allowing the team to drop down, regroup, and track the illicit ballistic chemical biological weapons deal in under a minute. Their inside man is there, and the missile with the mysterious payload within. So everyone just lines up like that at a fucking carnival and lets loose, doing everything in their power to win the fluffiest teddy bear. To be fair, they had to do something to save their mole, which includes blowing up that mysterious chemical biological missile thing. Whoops. Ah, fuck it. While each and every character works hard to establish their skill at killing people, Mr. Mole rushes deep into enemy territory to save Angelis. I'm getting you out of here.
But Marquez is so evil. Not only did he slit that man's throat, but he even went out of his way to take that scientist chemical weapons expert that he kidnapped and put more clothes on her. Well, it's not like I'm going to get any joy out of looking at the dinosaurs. Either way, they continue their stealthy surgical operation by killing the fuck out of anyone and everyone that moves. This methodology doesn't do much to impress the higher-ups, but they have bigger problems to deal with. Did they fire the missile off? Negative. But it looks like it detonated. Chemical agent may have been released. Turns out the higher-ups have an even higher-up, Agent Grimaldi, played by Bennett himself, Vernon Wells. Sadly, he has given up on maniacal laughter and kidnapping Schwarzenegger's daughter to become the overbearing boss he just wants to get the movie over with and kill everyone as soon as possible. Nothing happens until my men are clear of that zone. Yeah, well, they're doing a real good job, aren't they? Uh, I guess so. Thanks. The missile going off may or may not have caused bad stuff that needs containment, but fuck it, they have to save the girl. But, oh no, the bad guy got to her first. What is Captain Stakely to do? <laughs> Jesus, man, I thought bad guys knew to hold your human shields in the front. Like shields. The masterful, Seagal-like skills of shooting the guy with only 40% of his body exposed allows Stakely to both rescue Angeles and capture Marquez. Now all they need to do is get out of there. Problem is, being a war zone, it's not particularly safe, and they are instructed to head out four clicks to the extraction point. But... fuck walking. Just bring the bird down on this location immediately. Out. He's terminated communication. Oh. Well, I guess we gotta send people off to their inevitable death now. I mean, what else can we do? The man hung up on us! Grimaldi warns the colonel that if the chemical, biological, missile dust stuff escapes, there will be hell to pay. Yeah, this doesn't mean he stops the guy from sending the chopper into the hot zone anyway. We see immediately why this was a stupid idea, considering they're instantly under enemy fire. But what's worse, once they do manage to get everyone inside and take off. It's almost like there's a good fucking reason you're supposed to go somewhere that's actually safe to fly before flying people in to fly your ass out. They're fine, though. It's really hard to kill an entire squad of soldiers with CGI this bad. What's that? What happened? Where the hell did they go? From the looks of it, back to the PlayStation 2. It's strange, though. This makes no sense for a helicopter to disappear, even in a crash, so they make their plan to find them. It consists of doing fuck all and just hoping they pop back up on the grid at some point. This might be difficult because things have scattered pretty badly on the ground, and Marquez has escaped. At least the soldiers survived. Mostly. Corporal, grab Felix. Felix is gone, Chief! And that's about the best performance in the movie. Seriously. Hudson and Dillinger must have fallen somewhere. We should go look for them. Indeed, they're the only two who had fallen out of the side of the crashing helicopter, resulting in some nasty injuries compared to the rest. Uh, y y you know, the rest who aren't dead. However, only one of them is able to walk, so he heads off towards the smoking wreckage to get the others, leaving an oh-so-tempting morsel all by his lonesome. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, this would happen the day I leave my quad rocket launcher at home. Therefore, it doesn't take long for the dinosaurs to keep the body count rising. Also, all that screaming does get the other man to come back and discover the horrors of this jungle. And a lot of the raptors are like, Jesus, it's going to be like that. Fine, I'm going. God. Going around to the other side to rip you into pieces. Because in this universe, raptors are bulletproof. Not only are there men being eaten, but Marquez is sneaking up on Stakely. And Stakely easily turns that around, capturing him again. I feel like I should turn chunks while well, that was a fine use of our time into a meme. While the army men effectively do nothing and are slowly eaten by dinosaurs, Grimaldi and Carter continue to argue over what to do. Carter is trying to save his team, waiting for them to save themselves, but Grimaldi thinks the chemical virus weapon thing didn't get destroyed in the blast, and they need to carpet bomb the site just to be safe. I'm gonna have to bring down the hammer. Well, what the hell is that supposed to mean? He 
He's going to destroy absolutely everything with the ancient and awesome powers of Thor. Apparently the chemical missile thing was a virus chemical missile thing that infects other things or something, and containment is key. Not like Carter gives a damn about any of that, insisting that Grimaldi gives his team 48 hours to re-establish communications. No, you don't get 48 hours. You get 24 hours, and not one minute more. How about 59 seconds? Oh, that's it! We are nuking them right now! Most of their gear is fried, the helicopter is toast, and the radio can't seem to get any reception. Tensions are high, of course, but it doesn't take long for even more weirdness to be pointed out. Angelis points out that the generic-looking jungle is actually filled to the brim with mysterious, never-before-seen plant life, and even the air itself is strangely thick. And what would make you the environmental expert? I'm a chemical biologist. Well, that's all well and good, but how the hell does that qualify you to be a botanist and environmental scientist? Either way, the radio has no reception here, so maybe they'll have some luck on higher ground. With that in mind, they load up and move out, eventually finding what's left of a bloody uniform and questioning what could have possibly done such a thing. You know, whatever did this has two feet, three claws, and moves pretty darn fast. Aquaman, how could you? Whether this is some strange animal or cosplayer is a mystery for another day, though. At least until the man pulling up the rear, Potter, played by Aaron Erskine, decides to sit and examine it himself, allowing everyone to leave his ass behind. And of course, when you're lagging behind and don't know what's around you, but know there's definitely something there, do not rush back towards the group. Wait around to be killed. Wouldn't you know it, though? His neck injury means he can't scream for help, leaving everyone to completely disregard the sounds of splashing, thrashing, and tearing going on, taking this man out. They do eventually notice he's not there, but eh, he's probably okay. Let's just send two guys back to find him, while Stakely tries the radio again, only to see something weird in the bushes, and decide to round up the whole group in a hurry. What did you see up there that got you so spooked, boss? I don't know. Be more vague. Uh, it was like... Yeah... His talk of some strange lizard thing stalking him from the bushes gets Angelis to talk about the possibility that they are in fact in a crater with a closed-off ecosystem potentially separated from the rest of the world for millions of years! Kinda like... The Lost World. Like the movie? Well, which one? There were like three. Obviously, Sarah's talking about the book with the hidden plateau cut off from the world full of DINOSAURS! So it's like the movie, then? Well, the 1925 movie, yes. Possibly the 60s one. Either way, the idea of running into dinosaurs is just silly, so they drop that and decide to simply be wary of whatever weird creepy crawlers they might encounter along the way. Hate the jungle. Didn't expect them to find one quite so literally, though. But this means now Marquez has a knife. But what of those two looking for Potter? Well, Raptor jumps out and takes out Flores, and then... <laughs> it's not the gunfire or screaming that tipped off the group, but rather the Raptor's disappointed groan at how crap the action is. By the time everyone makes it over to rescue the guys, they've both been torn to shreds. Ah, oh, well, I guess you don't have to go checking for them now. So it's time to find that higher ground. Because they're in a crater, of course, their radio can't make contact. But if they can find a good clearing, at least maybe they'll get something. I'll be damned. I like the fact that, despite their stupidity, it's kinda hard to keep dinosaurs hidden forever. What would they happen to spot here, though, but that science guy from the opening who ran off and was never brought up again? It seems he lived, and has gone native in the intervening years. Oh, yeah, it's been years. I guess that's kind of important to point out. The point is, he's here now, and Stakely can walk up to him, freak him out, and cause the nearby Triceratops to go crazy! Are you insane? Oh yeah, that 223 would have done great against a tank made of meat and bones. You, you could have killed it. Well, last I checked, he's not packing a 50 Beowulf. And even if it was, it would have a hell of a time taking down a motherfucking Triceratops. Before they can finish making fools of themselves, a T-Rex shows up. Thus, quickly passing a handgun to Angeles, like, that'll do fuck all in this situation, they run to help. 
Funny thing, while Professor Roxton was terrified at the idea of Stakely making Stakeums out of the herd, he's downright ecstatic watching the Tyrannosaurus Rex kill the shit out of them. Marquez takes this opportunity to exit stage left, but of course, it's a movie T-Rex, so it's not hunting, just killing everything it can see. the fuck? First, first you show the gun completely ineffective against raptors. Now, this this gun that is firing, at best, a 5.56 can take down a motherfucking T-Rex. That's like rhino hunting with a 22. Or, for those of you who are not familiar with firearm calibers, it's kind of like trying to kill an alligator with a sewing needle. On the plus side, it's not actually dead yet. Because it takes a handgun caliber to do that. Son of a bitch, where is Bert Gummer when you need to school some motherfuckers? Anyway, the professor gathers a group together, and they escape the jungle into his private cave. While his friend died the day he arrived at the crater, he made the best of a bad situation and spent the last five years studying dinosaurs in the wild. Also, it seems that Angeles is quite the big fan of his. It's an honor, sir. I've read all of your papers on phylogenetic systematics. Your discoveries are fascinating. Don't expect anything to come of that, though. This man really, uh, really likes dinosaurs. Stakely, though, would really like to find a way out of here, but that's easier said than done. After five years of searching, the professor has only found one potential path through an area he has named Death Valley. Because death! What's so big and bad down there? Another T-Rex. <laughs> it's much worse. Much worse. Don't get your hopes up. It's not a Spinosaurus or an Indominus or... Anything like that. Just keep in mind how much he hyped that up. Point is, they're safe for the night. You know, as long as you forget the whole 24 hours to 10,000 degrees thing from earlier. So Sarah does what movie ladies in harsh survival situations tend to do, and takes a sexy bath in their only source of drinking water, before morning comes and they head out. Both to find the entrance to Death Valley, and to find out where exactly Marquez has snuck off to. Just over there, so he can get instantly caught. Again. It's almost like his constant escapes has just been a complete waste of everyone's fucking time. Stakely does decide to take a page out of Predator and drop the weapons to fight Marquez hand to hand. Considering we've consistently watched Stakely kick his ass all movie, the outcome can only be surprising if something ridiculous happens. Like the characters remembering, oh yeah, there's dinosaurs in this movie, maybe we should stop being morons! The sound gets everyone else to rush to their aid, shooting the oncoming horde of poorly animated eyesores. But somehow, yes, the guns now work on raptors, isn't that something? With that over with, now Marquez is back with the group. Really not showing much value and is running off constantly. But he's not the only one breaking away every now and again. The professor stops everyone in a specific area because he's got a pee and heads off. Only to provoke a triceratops and send it running into everyone! Oh no, they got... him. The, the, the guy. He, he's been there the whole movie. He seems kind of important. It just, and they only ever refer to him by his rank, not his name, and I have no fucking idea who he is. Ah! Oh, yes, of course, our good friend. Ah! Amazingly, the characters actually stopped being stupid long enough to figure out, hey, the professor ran off and suddenly a trike attacked. It was deliberate. He tried to kill us. Unfortunately, that lucid period is very brief, and they start talking about the merits of the professor's sudden desire for murder. As it turns out, Marquez thinks he's got the right idea. Also, it turns out Marquez is a communist, I guess. You capitalists believe the entire world belongs to you. Uh, that, that's... What? That hypocritical can of worms aside, the event didn't change shit outside of the body count and the runtime, because the plan is still go to Death Valley and escape the crater. I think the valley's just over the, those rocks. Yeah, but it'll be getting dark soon. Don't you think we should just shut it down? Didn't they only have 24 hours to live? I mean, what exactly happened to that plot point? Shouldn't they all be making napalm angels right now? Well, if we remember to establish plot points, the movie would be over and we've still got like 10 minutes left, so instead, we find out just what it is that Death Valley holds that is so much more terrifying than the Tyrannosaurus Rex.
Welcome to Death Valley. Several Tyrannosaurus Rexes. Also, there is no way out. Not that the professor lied to them. No, it's just the way out is high ground that the radio can establish communications with. Makes sense if you don't think about it. Thus, they move forward with their escape plan, rushing towards the high ground with what little ammo they have left. Of course, the professor, being a professor, is a fucking moron and runs off on his own to get eaten by a T-Rex because... Yeah, body count, I guess. On that note, Grimaldi finally realizes that 40 hours is longer than 24. This is Grimaldi. Order the strike. Glass that jungle now. Ah, sure, Jungle Strike is a fun one, but I personally think the best ones were on the PlayStation and Saturn. Soviet Strike and Nuclear Strike. Not wanting this outcome, Carter does the calm, rational thing, and pulls a fucking gun on Grimaldi to convince him to change his mind. Also, Tank, played by Bernay Velasquez, gets fucking ripped apart by a Velociraptor. Because those are in the valley too. Ah oh, well, most of the group is almost out of there, which means it's time for Marquez to remind us all he's the bad guy with very bad ideas that never, ever, ever have worked out in his favor. But why stop now? You carnivores think that the whole population is edible. Therefore, obligatory happy ending! Bad guys died, while the captain and women survived. But there's that whole virus thing we never got closure on. So how do we explain all this? We don't. Well, this is fucking great. Thank you! Well, that was Rise of the Dinosaurs. It's almost average. There's nothing really special about it. That is nothing of note that makes you think, wow, that movie really shined in that area, and it is a measurement of quality. There are plenty of unique points to Rise of the Dinosaurs, but yeah, let's get started. Most of the presentation is pretty damn average. Soldiers, check. Jungle, check. Suits working for and or against soldiers in the background, double check. The basic story we start off with is next to pointless. It explains how they got in the jungle and why Grimaldi kept trying to kill them, but it's dropped shortly after the dinosaur problem comes up. That's understandable from the character's perspective, but it leaves us with a much simpler plot of helicopter crash, surrounded by dinosaurs, escape from dinosaurs. Not exactly pushing the boundaries of filmmaking. A movie can be fun, though, and it doesn't have to try to be some grand showcase to do it. But that's where the presentation really drops the ball here. CGI is something that a lot like me complain about regularly, because honestly, even when it looks good, it tends to look fake as fuck. Here, a holy shit, was it done badly. The CGI characters did not mesh with the scenes they were planted in at all, and the animation was so fucking borked it was laughable. Considering these digital disasters were the central threat and spectacle of the movie, the absolutely terrible quality of them did quite a bit to drag the whole thing down, coming in at two twitchy triceratops out of five. We had a story of a Sega CD game with acting out of a Sega CD game, and CGI from a Sega CD game. Ugh. Thank you all for watching, I've been Decker Shadow, and remember, beware Death Valley, because DEATH! So it's like the movie then.